This is where we live. I'm John Dankosky. Last night, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were declared the winners in New York's primary by wide margins. A new Quinnipiac University poll released this morning shows the same results are likely in Connecticut next week. Those front runners have been making their presences felt. Last Friday in Hartford, it was Donald Trump. I love being with you. You know, I've lived in the state and I know the state and I have the greatest friends. Some of my greatest friends are from the state. A lot of great people up in Hartford. Here is, except the insurance companies charge me too much money, which I hate. Okay. <laughs> we'll get into that later. Coming up tomorrow, Hillary Clinton breezes through town. Bernie Sanders is set to arrive in New Haven this weekend. We'll preview the Connecticut primary. We'll dive into the battle over the budget at the state capitol, a fight that has degenerated into some verbal bickering. You can join the conversation. 860-275-7266. Comment on our website, wnpr.org slash where we live. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Joining us, as always, is Colin McEnroe. He's the host of The Colin McEnroe Show on WNPR. Hi there, Colin. Good morning, Mr. Dankowski. Also with us is Keith Fanoff. He's the state budget reporter, our own budget Obi-Wan Kenobi for the Connecticut Mirror. Hi there, Keith. Thanks for having me. How do you respond to that? <laughs> Danielle, this isn't the budget you're looking for. <laughs> Danielle, it, it certainly is. A Danielle Altamari is State House reporter for the Hartford Current. Hello there, Danielle. How are Hi, you? Hi. How are you? Well, I'm doing quite well. I, so last night, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were declared winners in New York primary. I mean, we sort of knew what was going to happen on the Republican side. We weren't entirely sure what was going to happen on on the Democratic side. Uh, before we get into some of the Q poll results that we have this morning, um, results that show, well, the, the front runners are leading in the front in Connecticut as well. Any takeaways from last night's New York primary, Colin, for you? Well, I mean, I, I think on the Democratic side, um, the likelihood that Hillary Clinton is going to be the nominee went up considerably, right? I mean, if if she hadn't had a strong performance, it would have been sort of seppuku time. Uh, but in fact, she did have a strong performance. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of delegate math, in terms of projections, I, I was watching at one point uh, Nate Silver at 538, his stream last night, and they were trying to figure out, you know, the way the, the way that they talk about this is percent of probability. So he said, I don't know whether there's a 95 percent probability that she secures the nomination or a 99.5 probability that she secures the nomination, but it's somewhere in there. So, you know, on that side, I think there is kind of news. You know, it it was going to be hard for Bernie Sanders to get the nomination before yesterday, but it really got hard uh, after last night and puts a lot of pressure on him in a lot of places, including Connecticut. Well, and before we get to the Republicans, I just want to say one thing that that we we have been looking at is everywhere that Bernie Sanders has done well, we've had this very high voter turnout, very enthusiastic crowds beforehand. We had high voter turnout in New York yesterday, and that still didn't bode terribly well for Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of reasons why she might have won New York, but uh, one thing that may have hurt Bernie Sanders a little bit, and we can sort of talk about two candidates this way. We often talk about Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in similar ways. They're both kind of undisciplined candidates, right? And they paint in broad strokes. Uh, it, it's not even clear that that you know that Trump has anything other than broad strokes in which to paint. But Bernie kind of does that too. And, and we're getting to the point where discipline becomes important, uh, where concentration becomes important, where detail becomes important. So Bernie got hurt going into New York by the Daily News interview, in which it looked like he didn't really sort of have uh, a short game. You know, he didn't really have uh, details when he was asked for them. He got hurt by other things. It may not have been a great thing to go to the Vatican right before uh, a primary. He had some stumbles that involved other people. The Democratic horse uh, comment by a person introducing him was something that he had to spend a whole news cycle apologizing and getting back from. So as you go in there, as you go into some of these last few and head towards the convention, discipline's important and, and detail and nuance get even more important. And I think that's starting to hurt Bernie. Trump, meanwhile, is in the middle of fixing that up, you know, seeing if he can get a little better at it. Uh, Keith, any takeaways for you from, from what happened yesterday? Uh, honestly, I, I was watching it. I was not surprised. I think that's what a lot of people were expecting. It, it still keeps bringing me back to Connecticut, though, and I, I am wondering if the Connecticut Republicans are watching what Donald Trump did in trying to figure out the strategy of how they're going to distance themselves from him uh, when he comes into this state. 
You know, of course, uh, Daniela, you got a chance to see Donald Trump as he was heading through Connecticut. He said he's he vows to even come to Connecticut a couple more times before mm-hmm. next week's primary. No, you got a chance to actually stand and, and talk with him for a couple minutes. What did what did you uh, what did you take away from your conversation with the Donald? Well, it was hard. It was seven minute conversation backstage. Um, you know, he uh, he talked about GE, which obviously as a as a president, he won't have a whole lot to do with. Um, you know, he, he seemed to be uh, fairly well briefed, but um, you know, it, it's hard in, in those uh, situations. What was interesting when he did come to Connecticut is, you know, to Keith's point about, you know, the state Republican Party distancing themselves. I mean, I didn't see any there, – there was nobody there uh, prominent from, from the state Republican Party. Everybody stayed away, uh, which is, is certainly very telling. But but there were, you know, a couple thousand people who yes. – some of them were Democrats probably in yep. former lives. Some of them were independents. Uh, a lot of them were, were Republicans uh, who wanted something a little bit different. So maybe no Republican establishment, but I don't know. Daniela, over the course of the years here on this program, we've certainly said that the uh, Republican establishment in Connecticut probably doesn't have the strongest and deepest bench right now. It's sort of hard for them to put up candidates in statewide races. So is it is it terribly surprising that we don't have a whole bunch of prominent Republicans showing their face at a big Donald Trump rally? Well, I think you you, you make a good point. I mean, that you know, his appeal crosses all kinds of boundaries. We did a story uh, two weeks ago. I mean, there are so many Democrats that just love the guy. They can't even vote in the primary. It's too late for them to change. But they love the guy. So, you know, he, he crosses all kinds of lines. So, of course, this morning, Colin, we see the Quinnipiac University poll. Maybe not terribly surprising what, what we're seeing here. Again, Donald Trump running in the front by, by quite a ways. Hillary Clinton pulling out to a, to a slight lead in front of Bernie Sanders in Connecticut. Yeah, although I just want to go back to some, a couple of things that Daniela said and kind of enlarge on, on them. One of them, just to, to the last point, I was thinking at the rally, Daniela and I were at the, the Trump rally together, I was thinking that in some ways— Trump will run in a general election a little bit like John Rowland. John Rowland did pretty well with the people that she just described. For example, conservative Democrats from kind of um, edge places that are not exactly urban, but certainly not the suburban. Valley, so, the Naugatuck Valley. The Naugatuck Valley, like but even places like North Haven yep. and stuff like that. The, the havens that aren't New Haven, you know. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he, the outer I, havens. Right, the outer <laughs> havens. You know, I, I mean, well, Trump and East Haven, I mean, what could be a better combination? But, um, but you know, I mean, I, I would imagine that he's going to run pretty well in those kinds of places if he gets to the general election. I don't know whether he runs well enough in those places to put a lot of heat on the presumptive nominee, Hillary Clinton, so she's got to spend resources here. But he might. He might be if he became that kind of rolling candidate who could fish out of conservative unaffiliated, uh, conservative Democrats and get some Republicans. The other thing I'll quickly say is that obviously no prominent Republicans from Connecticut joined him on the dais uh, on Friday night. Um, first of all, there really aren't that many prominent Republicans anymore. That's, that was my point from earlier, yes. Yeah, there aren't that many. But you know, to whatever extent they are and they have names that can put their names on what they do, most of them have lined up with Kasich or they're staying clear of this whole thing. Um, but there, in terms of background people, there were some interesting people there. Ben Proto, who is one of the smartest kind of background guys that you could have, was sort of staffing uh, Trump in Connecticut. He's a, What makes him interesting, too, is he's a McCain guy. McCain is in many re- respects the ultimate Connecticut national candidate, right? The state has always liked uh, McCain. and He won the state in 2000 over George W. Bush. It's a little shocking to see a guy like Proto go to work for Trump because Trump has said such unkind things in the past about McCain. Uh, you kind of wonder, you know, that seems like a primal wound somehow or that you couldn't get over. But so he's got Proto working for him. I talked to some other people, too, Justin who were out Clark. there. Justin Clark. You know, I mean, there were some other people who hadn't really quite committed, so I'm not going to say their names, but they, they're, they're, they're sort of Romney-type people. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the guys who were not dressed in the T-shirts, there were some guys standing there on the sidelines who were sort of Romney-type people who were there kind of looking at Trump and, well, maybe, you know. So it's not as though he can't get anybody to help him. And, <laughs> and it may be more important to get those guys to help him than it is to, you know, to get – a bunch of state reps. I don't know. Look, looking at them like uh, I know this is a car that you're trying to buy. It was kind of like that. It's kind of a little bit like that, Keith. Uh, I I think Colin raises a good point, which is you know the general thinking is, uh, for example, that the state house Republicans and and the state Senate Republicans who smell blood are going to stay away from Trump because they think they have a chance to make inroads this year. But I wonder if Trump couldn't help them in the sense that if he somehow produces a surge in Republican turnout. And again, if they can have the right strategy to distance themselves um, without offending – does he have a base in Connecticut or whatever you want to call it, his supporters? I'm wondering if Donald Trump still couldn't in some way help 
Connecticut Republicans at the ballot. Well, well look, it's from uh, from January 1st through the middle of last week, 66,000 and change new voters have registered in our state. 30,815 as Democrats, 14,355 as Republicans. Um, w- what that suggests is more people are joining. Both of these parties, Daniela, people are joining so that they can vote for Bernie Sanders or, or Hillary Clinton. People are joining presumably so they can vote for Donald Trump or somebody on, on a never Trump campaign. But there is maybe something to what Keith's saying. If you get more people energized, it might mean something for the people down the ticket, including those running for state legislature. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, all, all these candidates, especially, you know, when you look at the Bernie folks, you know, they're certainly fired up and they could have an impact. I, I think, as Colin said, nothing matches the discipline uh, and the experience of the Clinton team. So ultimately, how, how much uh, effect they'll have remains unknown. But, you know, they're certainly fired up and that could spill over. What, what does it mean to you, Colin, that, that Hillary Clinton has a, a 51 to 42 percent lead in this Quinnipiac poll that, that, that just dropped today? More information on our website, WNPR.org, if you want to see some of the cross tabs on this. I mean, it's maybe a little bit bigger lead than some people who I have talked to who assumed that, that Bernie was building a, a pretty sizable um, a pretty sizable uh, contingent of people to support him in the state. Yeah. And, you know, these new registrations, those are Bernie registrations, right? I mean, uh, preponderantly. And, and that also includes switches from unaffiliated to Democrat. Um, I think those are overwhelmingly Sanders registrations. So that's potentially good news for him. This might be a state. I mean, going into yesterday, I was sort of emailing back and forth with a bunch of other political junkies. And, uh, you know, I think we're all kind of agreeing that Connecticut would presumably be an easier place for Bernie Sanders to win than New York. Um, The poll today kind of suggests that that he may struggle to do that. Um, But I I do think he'll probably – he may outperform the poll numbers. He's got that nine-point spread. I'll tell you the crosstab that just jumps out at me. I mean, we all know that Bernie does very well among the young. It's incredible here. Uh, In the 18 to 34 bracket, now keep in mind, overall, Bernie's behind by nine points. In the 18 to 34 bracket, he's up 73-26. So going forward, <laughs> the Democratic Party, now some of the people who are Bernie Sanders supporters right now are kind of kind of age out of their ideological uh, position. I mean, they're sort of, you know, they're feeling a little bit reckless. They feel like they've got nothing to lose. You know, they, they want a revolution, all this kind of stuff. As they get older, maybe they won't. But I mean, the, the youth movement that he's created right now uh, is pretty impressive. But the, the, those total numbers are impressive. But when you go to the overall numbers and you look at where Hillary Clinton has strength, not surprisingly, once again, amongst African-American voters, not surprisingly, once again, uh, with among women voters, Colin. And that really is the strength of the Clinton campaign. It's been the strength of the Clinton campaign all across America. And the question The question is always how many of those young voters really, really actually show up, put in the party registration on time, because there's all sorts of crazy, convoluted, cockamamie rules about that in Connecticut, and and, and get a chance to go vote for Bernie and make a difference. Yeah, so, I mean, my guess is that Hillary Clinton is going to build on last night's success, and she's going to win in Connecticut. I mean, these polls suggest it, and these polls were done before last night. She's got some momentum right now, uh, and, and the math for Bernie is getting so hard, you kind of wonder how motivated people will be. I actually think, for the most part, a lot of his supporters will solve that problem, the problem that you're talking about. They'll get themselves registered. They'll get themselves to the polls. They, they may not be enough. I think you might see a bigger problem with Trump voters. Trump voters, you know, I mean, not to get into this whole thing, but some of them are kind of low information voters. They may not understand the process. They may not know it's a closed primary. You know, they may not know that they, that they can't just show up and vote for Trump if they haven't registered as Republicans. You might have some arguments at the polls when people uh, aren't on the voter rolls that they think they should be on. When you were talking to people at this Trump rally, Daniel, last week, were you, were you talking to people who sort of knew, like, I, I'm registered now as a Republican. I'm going to go vote for Donald Trump. I'm going to go turn my passion for this candidate into a vote in Connecticut. Uh, no, not necessarily. I think Colin's right that, you know, a lot of people don't really understand the process. It is a little confusing. It's it's too late to switch if you're, you know, registered with another party. If you're not affiliated, you can, you know, still uh, you can still get in the game. But um, if you're a registered Democrat, there's no way. Yeah, that's right. If you're a registered Democrat, you can't do it. There's a different time if you're a brand new voter. There's all sorts of rules. Yeah. I'm sure if you go to the Secretary of State's homepage and you take about a day out to just look at it, <laughs> you'll figure out what the voting days are. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about one issue that crosses over between the Connecticut state budget and this presidential race. It is actually General Electric. We're also going to turn to what's happening at the state capitol with the state budget right now. It's devolved into a bunch of bickering between Democrats and the Democratic governor. If you want to join us, 860 275 It's the wheelhouse where we live.
This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankosky. Today, it's the Wheelhouse, our weekly news roundtable. The State House reporter for the Hartford Current is here. She's Danielle Altamari. Keith Vanoff, who is the State Budget reporter for the Connecticut Mirror, is also with us, as is Colin McEnroe, who hosts the Colin McEnroe Show on WMPR. Pray tell, Colin, what is on your show at 1 o'clock today? Well, you know, Wordsworth said about the state budget process, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. And so we are going to be talking about the relevance of poetry in daily life. Why? In fact, Neruda's dream that, that scholars and, and peasants would share poetry together doesn't seem all that true in modern life, especially in this country. Especially especially in politics, certainly. One o'clock this afternoon, poetry on the Colin McEnroe Show. I do hope you can join us. Before we turn away from presidential politics, I, I want to get to a couple of things. These uh, Quinnipiac results are interesting, Colin, because, yes, there's a large lead on the Republican side for Donald Trump. John Kasich uh, polling in second place, not terribly surprising given that Ted Cruz is not what we'll call a connection. Connecticut values uh, candidate. But all that said, that number 50 percent is really important going into the primary for Donald Trump. Right. So usually if you're leading 48, 28 over your closest rival, that's pretty good news. But it's not good news here, really. Donald Trump needs he'd be in better shape if that number were 55. And and who cares what Kasich's number is? Um, Because 50 percent. I mean, your unconcealed irritation about the complexity of voter registration rules in (laughs) Connecticut uh, could only be matched by how unbelievably complicated the Republican Connecticut state's primary allocation process is. I am not going to attempt to describe it. I'll simply say the magic number is 50 percent, 50 percent plus one. If Donald Trump gets that, then he runs the table with the at-large delegates, and probably that will also be mirrored down at the congressional level, mostly. Now, keep in mind, he needs to walk out of here with, you know, as many delegates as he possibly can, uh, because he needs to try to get to 1237. If you believe that he's the kind of candidate who can't survive a floor fight in a contested convention. Can I say one quick thing about that? Because yes. I, I had a, an app or Sue last night right before I fell asleep, which is why I don't sleep better. But um, which is, you know, you keep hearing that, oh, well, nobody knows how to do this, right? Nobody knows how to have a, a floor fi- fight at a national convention. And the Times had a piece yesterday about how all these 85-year-old political operatives are coming back. And, and Paul Manafort, who's 67, he's not. Uh, but he knows what a floor fight is like. As a young guy, he went through that. Well, the truth is... Is there are floor fights all the time. They're at state conventions. Mm-hmm. People go through go through these battles all the time. I mean, uh, uh, maybe all of us. I can't remember, some of us here were probably there in let's see, 2006 when Malloy and DiStefano had this floor fight at the Democratic State Convention, where like at the end we weren't even <laughs> sure what happened. Malloy stood up in a chair and announced that he'd won, and then he walked out. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, we've seen these kinds of things. So it's not like there aren't any operatives who ha- who have. I mean, Trump can get a whole bunch of people who've done that. And, and, you know, it's not exactly the same at a national convention. It's close enough. It's close enough. And, and these are the sorts of things that you're right. We, we do see. Here's something we don't see too too terribly often in presidential politics. Candidates like Donald Trump, who was here last Friday, saying something like this. It doesn't help you folks much. At, we, at least we lost him to the United States. That's one of the few, right? To be honest. But that doesn't help you too much. But you can't lose General Electrics. You just can't. I don't know what happened. I will say this. If I were governor, I wouldn't be losing General Electric. That I can tell you. That I can tell you. Oh, so, so, Keith, here's, here's Donald Trump talking about something that we've talked an awful lot about. Of course, General Electric deciding to move its corporate headquarters from Fairfield to Boston. A lot of mudslimming back and forth about why that is, whether or not the governor should have been more involved, whether or not it's about state tax policy, why that is. But here he is essentially saying, well, we wouldn't have lost it, but of course it's going to the next state uh, up. I mean, what does it what does it say to you when Donald Trump's getting involved in the fight over General Electric? It says that the departure of General Electric got tons of national press. That's what it says. When the Wall Street Journal is writing editorials saying Connecticut's doing something wrong and they're citing GE as evidence, the nation notices, other businesses notice. It's a whole other discussion about why they're leaving. But when Donald Trump is talking about it, it's because the departure is getting national press and that makes everybody nervous. Okay, so it makes everybody nervous, but it's just it's sort of it's sort of funny to hear Danielle. I mean, a, a presidential candidate saying, you know, I, I was governor, I wouldn't have lost General Electrics mm-hmm. as he calls them, but at the end of the day, this this battle between the states, this really is a problem for the federal government. I mean, every single state in the union is fighting with these tax incentives and these cross-border battles to try to get companies just like this. It seems like the the, the sort of thing that a functioning federal government might be, get involved in and try to figure out ways to not spend our money uh, crossing borders in the way we are. 
Yeah, Trump has made his reputation as a, as a deal maker, for better or worse. You can argue how effective he is, but that's his that's his whole image, right? He's a deal maker, so you know he's saying Connecticut lost this deal. Of course, you know he's talking a lot about offshoring and things like that, and you know this that doesn't even apply here in the case of General Electric. Obviously, he, he also said in the clip that we heard earlier that uh, uh, you know he he likes everyone up in Hartford except for the insurance companies, which charge me too much money. Of course, I'm not sure exactly what President Donald Trump is going to do about the insurance industry here in Connecticut. Quickly, let's go to Aaron in Waterbury. Hey, Aaron, what's on your mind? I would just want to make a comment. You know, I don't remember whether Hakeem, when he was running for president, um, if he was winning or he was losing, but he had a lot of momentum. And then the media portrayed him as this angry candidate, and he sort of fell off. And I just think it's so interesting that now we have Donald Trump, who I would consider a very angry candidate, and he's almost celebrated. And I just don't understand the difference. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Aaron. Of course, Howard Dean, uh, Colin, uh, with the with the famous scream, and everyone goes, oh, my goodness, what's what that guy? He's crazy uh, sounding. And, yeah, we have a different political time. That was a little while ago. Some things have happened since then. But Aaron's point is, is one that I've frankly heard from an awful lot of people. Yeah, well, I mean, Howard Dean— First of all, I'm not really sure that he was portrayed as an angry candidate. His um, hot air balloon was actually losing altitude before the scream happened. Um, you know, probably the, the truth is that the dean's candidacy, I mean, obviously it's a little bit similar to Bernie Sanders, right? Bernie Sanders, there's two ways to look at Bernie Sanders. Uh, now it's like Wallace Stevens, all right? There's two ways of looking at Bernie Sanders. So you can look at him as he's basically George McGovern uh, and Jerry Brown and Bill Bradley and Howard Dean. There's always a candidate in the Democratic Party who sums up a set of liberal aspirations that aren't really reflected by the establishment. You know, and all of the people that I just mentioned either didn't get the nomination or did and then got slaughtered. Um, so there's sort of that, and in which case then it's business as usual from now on after this. Then, I mean, the other way of looking at him is he's a paradigm shift. You know, he's a completely different kind of candidate. So to me, that's a more interesting question. I don't really think Dean was portrayed as an angry candidate, uh, and, and I don't think that the, com- the contrast between Dean and Trump is a particularly intriguing one. Sorry, I, 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 I want to turn. I want to turn to Danielle and Keith before we have to take our break. Because in the last segment, we're going to really be talking about the state budget. But it is it is interesting to me some of the the topics that are coming up on the presidential campaign trail, including with you know with Donald Trump and in the people who he is energizing, and certainly with Bernie Sanders and some of the people that he's energizing as well. I mean, Connecticut is is facing some real serious economic. Struggles, some issues that when we talk about the things, Keith, that forced General Electric out, they said right off the bat, hey, it may not have to do with taxes or anything else. A lot of it just has to do with the certainty of what's going to happen here at the at the state level. We seem to always be uh, leaking money. And so maybe we'll never be able to write ourselves. Do, do you think do you sense that there is some real anger and or um, frustration amongst the Connecticut electorate about just the way things are going right now with the state budget, with the state economy that's playing itself out on the presidential campaign trail and, and maybe trickling down to the state legislative races as well. Uh, yeah, because when people talk about whether GE left or not because of taxes, that's like saying, well, my my problem wasn't that I got sick. It was the 12 burritos I ate beforehand. Um, the taxes in this case are are, are just the symptom Every state has debt problems. Connecticut and Illinois may be outliers at how severe their debts are, but just about every state is packing some serious problems, and it's that debt that leads to things like high taxes. It's the debt that leads to things like not having the money to invest in education and transportation, and those are the things that GE politely pointed at. But don't forget, when it all began, GE raised the issue of taxes. In June of last year, it was General Electric that put taxes on the table and and ultimately what they were talking about are the problems that Connecticut has that are forcing tax hikes and these are still problems that other states have and i think that's what the political analysts are picking up on well and that's what i'd like you to talk about again for a moment is yes illinois and connecticut seem to be outliers and you've chronicled just how outlying connecticut is with the enormous deficits that we've got coming I think it is fair to say, though, Keith, if you look around the 50 states, there aren't a whole lot of them that are doing all that well. I mean, no. th- this is something that is happening state by state, every single – I mean, Pennsylvania didn't even pass a budget. I mean, there's states that really are are in much worse shape, frankly, than Connecticut is. <laughs> well, there aren't too many when it, comes to, when it comes to debt. It's us in Illinois at the bottom. But, I mean, it, we may have three feet of water in their basement, but everybody seems to have at least six inches. 
And I think that's something that the, the candidates in the national debate are picking up on now. It's that it's this one thread they can develop that they can take just about anywhere. And somebody's heard, oh, you know, if, if you're appealing to labor, they had to have concessions. It's because of the debt. Or they raised your taxes. It's because of the debt. That's what I think these folks are picking up on. Yeah, I, I think when you talk to some of the Trump supporters, whether they are, you know, those sort of disgruntled Reagan Democrats or who, whoever they are, there's a real sense that they've been kind of left behind. You know, there's a lot of uh, folks who just feel sort of profoundly out of step with uh, with the way things are. And they, they feel, you know, uh, frustrated, angry, adrift. And they're looking for something. They're looking for answers. And if you start to sort of parse away at some of Trump's policies, a, a lot of them, I mean, you know, his, his stance on carried interests, for instance, they're right out of the Democratic playbook. They're very you know, it's it's kind of interesting, you know, uh, where the sort of the ideological, uh, um, you know, lines cross. With, well, uh, the well and in just the last minute that we have, Colin, I mean, one of the, the messages, the big message that Bernie Sanders has is, you know, it's whether or not it's the, the big corporate interests and the banks colluding against us, fixing a system that allows the little guy not to succeed. Well, I mean, here in Connecticut, an awful lot of those interests are, are like they're the big tax paying interests. I mean. <laughs> Some of the some of the really big financial players in the United States are based right here in Connecticut, and they probably don't want to see anything change too terribly much either. Yeah, I mean, I find myself wondering in the next uh, two electoral cycles, the, the state uh, general assembly elections that are coming up, and then the ones to follow that'll include, include a gubernatorial cycle. How is there going to be a Bernie Sanders movement in Connecticut? You know that that you see there. Uh, and I, I, I have a hard time sort of picking up that. I think it's much more likely that some of the dissatisfactions that express themselves among the Trumpians will express themselves within the political fabric of Connecticut. Colin McEnroe, uh, Keith Fanner from the Connecticut Mirror, Daniel Altamari from the Hartford Current. Stand by. We're going to take a break. We're going to ask for your support for all the great programming you hear on WMPR. We'll be right back in the wheelhouse where we live. This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankosky. Coming up on tomorrow's show, tax liens, it might be said, is not the sexiest topic. But for some property owners, tax liens can mean the difference between keeping or losing a home. Lucy Nalpathanchel will host as we take a look at how tax lien sales are affecting uh, some of Connecticut's most financially vulnerable residents. Susan Campbell joins us as part of her ongoing series with her taking a look at housing and homelessness. Hope you can join us tomorrow on the show. Today it's The Wheelhouse, our weekly news roundtable. Colin McEnroe, the host of The Colin McEnroe Show from WNPR is right here. Danielle Altamari from The Hartford Current. Keith Fanna from The Connecticut Mirror. We're going to turn our attention to the state budget. The battle over the state budget right now is becoming a war of words. Governor Malloy issued a revised budget proposal. Democratic Speaker of the House Brendan Sharkey called it a, quote, personal hit list. Sharkey and other Democratic leaders skipped a meeting with the governor and Republican leadership for a discussion about the budget because Sharkey told reporters he's still waiting on consensus revenue numbers that are expected to come out next week. It's, there's not a lot to talk about at this point because we're waiting for those consensus numbers. We're putting together a budget uh, that will make sense in that context. And to, to sit around a table and talk about why his, his ideas are bad and our ideas are bad isn't necessarily a productive conversation at this point. Let's put our budget together. That's what the governor said. He doesn't want to have, he doesn't want to have any conversations with anybody who does not have a budget proposal a complete budget proposal. So we're accommodating his demand. Okay, so Brendan Sharkey, the House Speaker, uh, there have been some nasty sort of wars of words and and press releases over the course of the last week, Keith. Maybe you can just uh, settle for us. What exactly is going on right now, and where are we with this budget negotiation? What's what's really driving the politics right now, as, as odd as it may seem, it's actually the deficit that we have to deal with 14 months from now. Everybody hears that the budget that that begins in July 1 is I'm going to use round numbers as about a billion dollars in the red. Well, the budget that begins in July of 2017 is more than $2 billion in the red. And every dollar of of red ink that we get rid of this July is another dollar you don't have to deal with with the bigger deficit. The governor wants this whole billion-dollar hole closed with spending cuts – the Democrats are saying basically if we give you that $1 billion, we have to eliminate the initiative we're running on, which is money we're going to give to cities and towns. And no one wants to say, well, come on. That, that, we're not really going to get to deliver that money anyway. Remember that bigger – sorry, I'm knocking your microphones all over. $2 billion problem is, is waiting for us. If the governor pushes too much though, the Democrats can leave. They don't have to do a budget. We have a preliminary one in place. That's a $1 billion out of balance. And nobody wants to be left with nothing cut. 
That's the game of chicken they're both speeding toward. If Governor Malloy and the Democrats do nothing, they come back next January with a huge mess in the current year, a bigger mess in the second with nothing gained on it. That's a nightmare. Well, and look, and, and Daniela, what the speaker's talking about there is, you know, consensus revenue numbers coming in. We, we, we've we had over the course of the last year a deficit in this year that seems to be just growing and growing. And every time we turn around, there's a new revenue estimate that's not where it should be. So they're plugging little holes in this year's budget. And then, as Keith said, these are turning into bigger holes in out-year budgets. And the question is, are we ever going to sit down and really say, well, this is a $2 billion problem a couple of years from now. Let's take a look at, at what this is going to mean. Or are we just going to play this game of chicken once again heading into the end of this uh, this legislative session? Right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, from the governor and from the Republicans about, you know, structural changes, um, really, you know, deep, serious structural changes. Um, you know, it, it's hard, though, because, you know, the politics are just so complicated with this. I mean, every time the governor comes up with a budget, he keeps, you know, cutting hospitals funds. And that's, you know, a sacred cow to, to the Democrats. Or I, I don't mean to imply that it's a sacred cow that they, you know, that it's it's not a worthy cause. It, it very well could be a worthy cause, but it's something that's really important to them. And as Keith mentioned, the, you know, the, the program to aid cities and towns and ECS funds and all these things that are, you know, really important to uh, to Democrats in the legislature. So it really makes it kind of hard to have a conversation when those things keep winding up on the chopping block. But, but I think one of the things that, that's maybe important is, uh, yeah, those things are important and Colin, to, to Democrats running for, for re-election. But they're also important to, like, I don't know, people in cities and towns and, like, folks who need stuff. I mean, that's really, that's really what government's there for, right? It's for the people who need stuff, not for people to get re-elected every two years. Right. So, I mean, in some ways, probably the most discussable part of this right now are the, are the ECS cuts, the cost of education, cost sharing. Uh, and there's, they're big for some towns. And they they are de facto tax hikes, right? I mean, to a certain degree, if you lose $1.5 million, you know, in, in state money, you've got to make that up somehow. Chances are your mill rate may go up. Um, uh, Malloy would say that he's tried to allocate the pain in an appropriate way so that the towns that are, already have crushing mill rates d- don't feel it as much. The towns that have, have huge educational hills to climb don't feel it as much. And we can maybe come back to that. But I just wanted to say overarchingly, uh, you know, we could sort of try to rank everybody on how much of a big red-faced baby they are right now. And it might be, <laughs> and we'd have to start – we'd have to talk about the legislative Democrats, the legislative Republicans, the hospitals, the state employees, and Malloy. I feel like Malloy right now is more the grown-up in this room than any of the other play holders, the stakeholders. They are, you know, I mean, and Keith and Daniela have more nuanced understandings of this than I do. But I feel like Malloy really is saying, you know what, these are the numbers. Uh, he doesn't even talk about the numbers down the road, but they're even worse. These are the numbers. Let's do it with the numbers. Let's do it the right way. And it's going to be horrible. It's going to be messy. It's going to be awful. Nobody's helping me right now. The state employees won't talk to me. You guys won't come up with a budget that actually does reflect the actual deficit, uh, I, you know, he got a great editorial from the New London Day, uh, which I essentially agree with. Like, if you're mad at Malloy, come up with your own budget that actually balances. Uh, there's a similar editorial in The Current today calling Sharky petulant. Uh, I, I, I think Malloy is kind of winning the public relations battle, and one way he's winning it is because he's right. Yeah. The problem is, and I, and I agree with Colin's analogy, as long as you're grading on the curve, hmm. but nobody is telling the whole story. The governor is basically saying, without saying it, guys, let's cut this sales tax money we're promising towns because they don't get it until after the election. And we all know after the election, we're going to renege on it anyway. We can't afford to give anybody anything. The towns may be counting on it, but they haven't gotten it yet. The Democrats are saying, governor, who are you to do this? You've got this sales tax money going for transportation. We all know we're never going to keep that money in transportation because we have big debts in the years to come. Why don't you give that up? Everybody has got something they want to keep. The illusion is safe for at least maybe another year. And then next January, we tell everyone, sorry, transportation's not happening. That sales tax money for towns is not happening. And your income tax is going to have to go up, right? That's the story. Now, they could turn around after the election and find some way to keep a portion of the money for towns by saying, OK, you're still going to get $80 million in sales tax money to cap your car taxes. But you'll notice, coincidentally, we cut $80 million from ECS. That's like me stealing Colin's wallet to buy him a birthday present. You're going to give the towns money in one program by taking it from another program. 
Um, you're already seeing the shell game start to happen with transportation. Yeah, in, in transportation, of course, the, the governor, Daniela, r- really wants to have this transportation lockbox, something that's probably not going to happen during this legislative session. This lockbox, a way to keep the Democrats and I suppose the Republicans from getting their hands on transportation money. But if we don't have the money to put into the transportation fund, it doesn't really matter if we have got a lockbox, does it? No, that's a good point. And, you know, talking about things that aren't going to happen. I mean, there's two weeks left in the legislative session, two weeks, and there's a lot of stuff that's not going to happen. And Malloy said yesterday he'll keep them there through the summer. I mean, well, he won't keep them there, but they'll stay there through the summer and work on a budget if quick, they have to. Quick note on the lockbox. The Appropriations Committee already showed not only did they cut some transportation money, but they put some general fund expenses into transportation, as in even if you lock the money in, we can always put new bills in the lockbox and have them paid out of transportation. Uh, you know, I spoke to Malloy yesterday. Uh, he called me, which never, ever, ever, ever happens. But I said, you're actually wasting your time. I said, I, I actually think you're being reasonable, and I never think that. And he said, can I get that on tape? Um, <laughs> and um, so I'm saying it now. But, um, but you know, just to go back to what you guys were saying before, I, I wonder whether Malloy would sign a tax hike. You know, I just wonder whether he, he would do that. Um, and it goes back to the conversation we had in the previous segment, how GE, and Keith's absolutely right, the, the actual – the details, the, the literal truth of GE is a much more complicated thing. But GE has become this kind of psychological placeholder for the notion that Connecticut has sacrificed some of the advantages it might have had in the past over other competing states by, raise, by, by creating too great a tax burden, parentheses, cutting ECS grants and jacking up property taxes is going to make that worse. But, um, so, but, but I wonder, I, you know, I, I think at this point, because GE has become symbolic of something else, it, it really gets very hard to, 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 to get the political momentum to have a tax hike, even but, if you have to have it. And, of course, Keith, it, you know, we, this is a political roundtable, so we're talking about things through the lens of politics. The, the problem is, is that one of the things you've been dealing with for years in looking at the state budget, it, it is actually it's a, it's a fiscal problem. It's an economic problem. It's a numbers problem, really. And it, it really doesn't matter how we feel about this or how we feel about a company leaving. What matters is, do we have enough money to run state government? So if we don't have enough money to run state government, it probably is going to mean some increases in revenue. It's probably going to mean some sort of negotiation, further negotiation with state employee unions on changes, including some structural changes that they're not going to like very much. It's going to include some cuts the Democrats really, really don't want to have cut, and they're probably going to really hurt some people down downstream. Those are all things that are going to have to happen because you're talking, Keith, in two years of a $2 billion budget. That's with a B. That's not a small little gap. Right. Thank you so much for pointing that out. It would take – the governor's trying to lay off about 2,000 people. It would take five times that number of layoffs to balance the budget (laughs) that starts starts in July. It would take 13 times the number of layoffs. We'd have to lay off almost 60 percent of the state workforce to balance the budget 14 months from now. You're not going to do it all with that because the problem is we have so much debt. We have big bills coming in. They're coming in every two years for about the next decade and a half. A lot of money is due in the short term. We don't even have time to grow the economy between tax hikes, and that's all that's left. It's not about what should be. It's like that's what's going to happen because of the amount of money that's owed. And and we don't have time to to raise revenue or do anything else between uh, campaigns uh, for re-election because we always seem to have one of those as well. So that leaves the the non-election years for all the pain. And so we have one year where we pretend everything's fine. You know, we're Kevin Bacon at the end of Animal House yelling, stay calm, all is well. And then the next year, <laughs> everything hits the fan. Uh, Joe in Southbury. Hey, Joe, is everything well? Yes. I'm well, not so well. <laughs> we have um, what, what my area is, which, which I don't understand. Um, uh, it, we watch CTN quite a bit. Uh, and I don't see anything about constru- the construction workers, the highway workers. I would recommend an immediate freeze on all non-emergency construction all over the state. We, uh, we we see all this new equipment all over, and uh, it's like Dr. Seuss, the Lorax with the trees. Uh, they're chopping all these trees down, some of which are never not even near the highways uh, or wires. And I understand, you know, they, they wanted to cut back from the outages we had, but it's gotten ridiculous. I would take a, an approach of having a four-day work week or layoffs in the highway department, and that's an area that we can really uh, – 
uh, attack. Well, we, well, and Joe, I'm going to leave it there because I, I really appreciate your point. But here's here's a question. So Joe pushes up against something. He says, well, we're spending a lot of money on highway construction. We're cutting down trees. We're spending money we don't need to spend. And probably everyone who takes a look at any part of state government could say, well, there's something that we could cut a little bit back on. What I do know is when we start to look at the the numbers of non-functional bridges in the state, the number of highways that actually need to be repaired before they actually turn into a real, real problem, the governor, I think, is probably right that we need to put some money into transportation, not from emergencies, just so that we actually have functioning roadways and bridges and rails in the next 10 and 20 years. Yeah, exactly. And and unfortunately, I, I, I don't doubt the caller has seen some construction, but more of our quote unquote construction exists on paper than it does in reality. We have billions of dollars in transportation bonding that's been approved by the state bond commission that we've never actually put into play, borrowed and, and spent. We can't get the projects we've got planned underway. Do, do we do this all summer long, Daniela, or do we actually come to some sort of resolution by the beginning of May? Who knows? Time's ticking. I mean, <laughs> T- time's I ticking. And as you said, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of other bills yeah. not getting done as people worry about this stuff. The things that actually matter to people. Yeah. I mean, you know, here Who we are <laughs> literally <laughs> two weeks away uh, from the a- adjournment of the legislative session. And there is a lot that still needs to be done. One minute, Colin. Yeah. I mean, you know, the politics of this is it, it, it's got to get done somehow. And, and if it doesn't get done somehow in a way that convinces the voters that they have a functioning state government and a working state budget and stuff, that doesn't you know, that doesn't bode well for Democrats in Connecticut in the near future. I was saying during the break, where do people think Scott Walker came from? You know, some portal from an alternative universe or from a bunch of people who were really kind of unhappy about how Wisconsin state government was being run? So, I mean, I don't think anybody here sitting in this room wants Scott Walker or his equivalent to be governor. But, you know, you could be setting the table for something like that. We, we just got a, a tweet here. Somebody does believe he came from a portal from another oh. universe, Colin, just so that you know. Colin McEnroe hosts the Colin McEnroe Show on WNPR. Thank you, Colin. Thanks to Daniela Altamari, the uh, State House reporter for the Hartford Current, and to Keith Fanneth, the State Budget reporter for the Connecticut Mirror. Now I'd like to thank you for supporting WNPR. If you haven't yet, here's how you can support the Wheelhouse and all the other things you hear right here.